Hi, and welcome back to Things Out Loud. Mark Zuckerberg mentioned in Meta's earnings call yesterday that more than 50% of the content people see on Instagram is now recommended by AI. Meta also dropped its new AI assistant built with their Llama 3 model. At the same time, Meta and Google have announced new chips to help them improve the speed of their AI. Google and Microsoft have all introduced new models or new features to their AI tools. It can seem like there's a lot going on that's too much to keep up with. That's why I try to focus on foundational principles, the underlying thinking that will remain true no matter what happens in the day-to-day news. It's also why I hope you'll enjoy this repost of a prior episode that looks at picks, shovels, and the AI gold rush. Coming at you right now. Welcome to Thinks Out Loud, your source for all the digital Well, hello again, big thinkers, and welcome back to Think Sound Loud, your source for all the digital expertise your business needs. My name is Tim Peter. This is episode 414 of The Big Show, and thank you so much for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. I think we've got a cool show for you today. I want to kick off by highlighting four news stories that tie into a larger point about the AI moment we're living through in marketing and sales and customer experience and why they're important and why they're important for your business. But I'm going to start with the news stories. The first is that Google uh, launched its Gemini Pro model uh, version 1.5. And I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail in a second, but I'm just going to give you the headlines first. So Gemini dropped, uh, excuse me, Google dropped Gemini Pro 1.5. OpenEye launched uh, its Sora video from text product. OpenAI might launch a search engine, it was reported the other day. And... (laughs) <laughs> ChatGPT over the last 24 hours or so has lost its damned mind. It's been doing some really weird stuff. So I'm going to do these in order first. Um, first, Google dropped Gemini Pro 1.5. This is a very, very cool tool. It's their ChatGPT or, or GPT-4 competitor. It's very, very cool. It can do things like multimodal uh, analysis, so you can feed it text or images or audio. And it's big, big enhancement relative to something like GPT-4 is that it can uh, input up to 1 million tokens. That's roughly 70,000 words of text or about an hour of video which is pretty extraordinary because you can then do some things with that material in memory that can't really be done any other way. The, the tech under the hood gets a little complex. Um, you know, there's, there's other ways to accomplish the same thing, but having a larger token set is impressive in its own right and opens up some possibilities that haven't existed before. For instance, you could have it, you could upload immense amount of data into memory and have it analyze that data rather than doing it a piece at a time, so you can get a better sense of the big picture. That's really, really cool. And something that is very hard for people other than Google to do, because it requires A, enormous processing power, and B, it's pretty expensive in terms of running the damn thing. (laughs) So that's, that's kind of a big deal. And something that, you know, a startup like OpenAI may have more problems with. Yes, Microsoft can probably do it. Yes, Amazon could probably do it. But the number of companies that can actually pull this off besides those big three is vanishingly small. One of the things that I think is important here is Benedict Evans noted in his newsletter, uh, he said it's pretty clear that it's not going, it, ChatGPT, or it, OpenAI, is not going to be the only company with, quote, the best models, unquote. There's a very real competition going on here between OpenAI and Google and Microsoft and probably Amazon and probably Facebook for who is the best um, 
AI out there. And that's something that's going to play out over time. Now, of course, OpenAI hasn't been sitting still the last couple of weeks. One, they launched Sora. Sora is so cool. I've played with it a little bit. You feed it a line of text and it can output video. And the videos are remarkable. Also, like we saw with image generation with the early versions of Dolly or Mid to Journey, they can be genuinely weird and disturbing. But when's the last time you heard people talk about images being AI generated images being weird and disturbing? Now they're mostly pretty good. And that's only taken a few years. So I'm more interested in what Sora represents over the long term than what it is today. And what it is over the long term is video accessible to everybody relatively inexpensively. More on that in a minute. The third news story, and the one that's sort of the centerpiece of this whole episode this week, is that there's a news story. The information reported that AI, OpenAI, might launch a search engine. I shared this on LinkedIn, and I, what I said at the time was, this is a major development with broad implications for businesses that get a significant portion of their website traffic from Google. Whether it's organic search, paid search, meta search, local search, etc., any loss in Google's market share could impact your revenue. This doesn't mean Google is going away or that they'll fail, but the potential market shift could have long-term effects. I mean, when's the last time we cared about a new competitor to Google, right? It's been a minute. So this could have a lot of effects on you in the longer term. And it's something I've talked about here quite a bit over the last few years. So I'm not going to belabor the point now, but I will come back to it a little bit later. The last news story I want to talk about is that ChatGPT did some weird stuff over the last 24 hours. I don't know if it's still going on. I don't know if it has been corrected yet. What I do know is <laughs> that <laughs> this thing has been doing some weird, wacky stuff. Um, I asked it to, uh, last night when I heard that this was going on, I asked ChatGPT for its take on how OpenAI's potential new search engine could affect the market. And I'm the first chunk it replied with was perfectly fine, perfectly normal. However, when it got to its fifth point, it started going off the rails in a weird way. And so I'm going to read you a lengthy excerpt. This is a quote from ChatGPT, starting with item five. Caveats to unbridled growth and self-correction the very appeal of every neotech market headliner is its scale and insatiability. First, will there be youth in all azure titted cubes, or perhaps governance, ethics, and disenfranchised auditoriums could hard stop correctly any singular surf logic, perhaps right-sizing to several bookhouse keepers? Six, future model policies and strategic legislation. New teleco landscapes or great shadowing lanes of e-clearance and host source munitioning personally might take traffic abreast anchoring light to algorithmic pendants. Unquote. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I want to be very clear. I, you're not having a stroke as you're listening to that. I'm not having a stroke as I'm saying it. But it sure seems like ChatGPT was. What in the world? I have to give you one more line to said. For those of you who are listening to this while you're driving in your car or something, I do apologize. I don't mean to make you like drive off the road or whatever. But its last line said, um, the seer's pipe calls for acceptance of not unusual throw, but swift strategics genius incrementals, and earthspin grit to not just take, but throw a mill's engine in case. What? <laughs> now, look, we all know that artificial intelligence, the generative AI tools, can experience what are called hallucinations. I've not seen any of the text tools hallucinate this badly in a 
pretty good while. Like, this is nutty. And last I knew, uh, as of, oh, 10 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday, February 21st, 2024, this was still going on some of the time. Which brings me to a smaller point I want to get here. Now, I have said for some time that ChatGPT faces an uphill climb. I've talked about the threats to Google a lot, but I haven't always talked as much about the threats to Bing, Microsoft, and ChatGPT. They absolutely could lose. I wrote in an article for HospitalityNet a year ago, this is a quote from the article, with no disrespect intended to Microsoft and Bing, they haven't found a way to bump Google from its throne despite decades of experience in the search market. Cool technology alone does not equal a successful product. Microsoft and Bing could win, but I'll believe they've succeeded this time when, you know, they succeed. End of quote. Right? It's not like Microsoft is new at challenging Google. They just have never managed to beat them. And as we're just seeing with this nonsense that occurred, that's kind of a sign of why this is so hard, right? ChatGPT has been doing great up until today or yesterday, and who knows what this is going to do to them. Uh, my very, very good friend Mike Moran and I have been having an email debate uh, slash discussion over the last couple of days, and he very, very, very uh, intelligently points out that Google is wise to move cautiously here. They are the dominant brand. They have the most to lose if it goes wrong, more than they have, potentially more than they have to win if it goes right. We certainly know people are motivated as much by fear, if not more so than they are by upsides. So it's understandable that they would be cautious. I have some specific issues when I talk about Google's lack of vision, that they're not communicating that caution well, in my view. But maybe other people feel differently. And this is certainly a sign of why you want to move cautiously if you're Google. By the way, I want to make a quick aside about Microsoft's position in the space at the moment. Um, I, again, some of this comes from my friend Mike Moran, who's, you know, despite the massive investments that Microsoft has made in OpenAI, they don't own the company and they don't control the company. Now, I've heard arguments from a number of people that suggest this is a benefit for Microsoft. They get all the benefits of OpenAI's models. They're only responsible for part of the cost, and they're very much isolated from brand risk during periods when ChatGPT does something like, I don't know, losing its damned mind. <laughs> right? If their products are isolated from that, that's no harm to them. There are also strong arguments to be made, some of these from my friend Mike, that talk about why this is bad for Microsoft. Yeah, they influence the product, but they don't control it. In other words, OpenAI probably listens to Microsoft, but they're going to do what's best for their business. It reminds me of a lesson I learned years ago about joint ventures between big companies. The joint venture has to exist for the benefit of the child, the joint venture itself, not the benefit of its parents, the companies that are jointly partnered on this thing. I led a joint venture between a hotel company and a group of outside investors, and we often struggled to move forward on things because each owner wanted different things that they felt were best for their businesses, not necessarily what was best for the business they did invested in that I was running. It can be really, really icky and frustrating if you have to deal with it every day. Trust me on this one, I know. <laughs> in any case, Microsoft is playing a very different game than Google and it's going to be interesting how this shakes out over the, you know, intermediate term, right? Uh, the benefits might turn out to be benefits. The, the downsides might turn out to be downsides. Uh, probably a little bit of both, but we're going to have to see what happens there. We know for sure that it's going to be a different reality than what Google's going through. And just to close the loop on why Google is so tough to beat, as I posted in a comment on that LinkedIn thread I referenced earlier, 
Um, I doubt Google loses right away, if at all. Not only do they have as much or more data than anyone else, they've got immense amount of processing horsepower available, a generally great brand, oh, and a war chest of more than $100 billion in cash on hand. By the way, that's billion with a B. <laughs> that's a lot of money. They're going to be really tough to unseat. Okay, so I said that these four news stories all had one common theme. And the common theme, the thing that I think you should be taking away from this, is the pace of innovation that we're seeing, and specifically the pace of technology innovation. I'm putting emphasis on the words technology innovation because we haven't yet seen innovation in business practices or business models. To me, when I look at what we're seeing right now, it looks a bit like the dot-com boom all over again. It's really hard to know where we are in big picture terms because everything is changing so fast. And I'd equate where we are at the moment to the internet maybe in 1997 or 1998. There's lots of cool technology. There's some cool products. And really only a handful of businesses, if that, that make any sense yet. Again, I refer to my point about Bing not yet beating Google. They've got good tech, but we're not sure if it's a good product yet. ChatGPT is good tech. We're not sure if it's a good product yet. Google is taking a deliberate pace with its product. I don't know what it's doing in terms of its tech. When I talk about their lack of vision, part of this is articulated vision. It's what are they saying out loud? Maybe the product ideas they have are phenomenal, but they haven't talked about them yet. They're still talking about the tech. Now, just to be clear, I said earlier, and I'm going to say this again, you know, good technology does not equal a good product. That's the place where many companies have failed. And we saw this a ton during the dot-com boom right? Uh, there was a company called Pets.com that essentially today is Chewy. But what they hadn't figured out was how do we actually deliver things like dog food economically? And so they burned through a ton of money and went out of business. There were companies like, um, oh, I don't know, Flues.com that was um, digital currency. There were companies like uh, oh, who am I trying to think of right now? Webvan that did grocery delivery, right? All of these are things that exist today, but not the companies because they didn't figure out how to make a business out of what they were offering. Yes, Google brought in really great search products, but also they brought in a really great business model with their ads and with ad stems, uh, with AdWords because that actually paid for all this and has made them an incredibly successful business. We'll see whether Microsoft or OpenAI is able to monetize generative AI in the way that Google monetized search and is able to turn it into a business in the same way. Right now, we just don't know. So that's something you really want to be clear about. The other reason that right now it's tough to predict exactly where we are is things are moving so fast. You know, my analogy that right now we're in 1997 or 1998 is we don't know if next year is going to be 1999 or if it's going to be 2004 or if it's going to be 2011, <laughs> right? Things are just changing that fast. What's definitely true is that we are in a gold rush right now. And as you all know, in a gold rush, the big winners are the people who sell picks and shovels. So when we start to think about who's likely to win in the AI moment or wherever we end up with AI, at least for now, the big winners are the folks you would expect it is. It's OpenAI, it's Microsoft, it's Google, it's Amazon, right? It's the people I was talking about over the last couple of weeks. I've been slagging Google like crazy. They're also not exactly, you know, collapsing under their own weight. My point has not been that Google will fail. 
My point is that they don't have as clearly articulated a vision as the other folks out there. And they, if they fail, that there is a playbook by which that's going to occur that they appear to be following. We'll see if that holds true, right? They're still in a very, very, very powerful position. They have long since figured out how to productize cool technology. And it's very clear that Microsoft has a clear vision of how to do that. And I think it's pretty clear that OpenAI and Amazon have a pretty clear way of how to do that. So we're going to see the dominant players probably remain dominant. You know, the threat to Google specifically, and I, I'm going to repeat something I said the other day, is that every time a customer uses any tool to search, so a developer uses GitHub Copilot, a shopper uses Amazon's Rufus, a marketer uses Microsoft 365 Copilot, a product manager riffs on an idea in ChatGPT, a writer uses Perplexity or Claude or so on, that's potentially a lost click for Google and lost revenues for Google. But notice what I said there. For the most part, I'm talking about Microsoft. I'm talking about Amazon. I'm talking about Microsoft. I'm talking about OpenAI. Yeah, Perplexity and Claude are new and could come out and be big winners in the longer term. But they're still a lot bigger than folks who are putting AI into their products and services, right? You would expect Adobe's going to be fine. You would expect that Salesforce is going to be fine. The people selling picks and shovels are the ones who are going to win, at least in the near term. Some of the folks who are out there right now with cool technology are going to end up being tomorrow's pets.com or tomorrow's web van. That's the reality that we're facing. And until, we, until things shake out a little more, I would still bet on the people who hold the picks and shovels. Which brings me to my largest point, and the one that I talk about all the time, which you've heard me say a million times on this show, that gatekeepers gonna gate. Notice who we're talking about in this. We're talking about the big tech folks. We're talking about the folks who are gatekeepers to you. And we're talking about the folks who get between you and your customer pretty much all the time. And if you're not thinking about how do I connect with my customer beyond the gatekeepers, beyond big tech, you're setting yourself up for a lot of trouble. I've given a scenario a number of times on various episodes of the show where I talked about Google losing just a handful of points of market share. If you think about it, you know, search that comes in at the top of funnel, information of search, means that's 5% of site visitors you can't retarget. It means your email list doesn't grow as fast. It means your ABM campaigns have less data to build from. It means that either you have to spend more to attract awareness and interest in your product or service, or you have to place your product on places like Amazon or Google product search or somewhere else. In either case, you're spending money with big tech. They win, you lose at least a little. You know, I think of companies I've worked with that get at least 5% of traffic from informational search that I'm reasonably confident turned into revenue later. Certainly a lot more than 5% of traffic and probably at least a bit more than 5% of revenue. And it doesn't matter whether you're a billion dollar company or a $10 million company, 5% at minimum is still a lot of money. Nobody likes telling their boss that they missed forecasts, even by, you know, as little as 5%. It's not a good place to be. So it comes back to how are you building connections with your customers independent of big tech? How are you building connections with customers so that regardless of whether they're using search or they're using AI or they're using whatever else comes down the pike someday, they still are looking for you. They are still connecting with you. They are still engaging with your brand and your business in a way that works for you. Because the other thing that we know about gold rushes is sometimes they're bust at the end. 
and you don't want to be the one holding a bunch of picks and shovels that you no longer need and having to turn back to the same company store you bought them from trying to find the next thing that will help you dig for gold. That's a losing strategy in the long term and one that you absolutely want to avoid no matter what next week's headlines happen to be. So we've had a really cool week for big tech. We've had a really cool week in AI. There have been lots of amazing news stories. So yeah, cool technology is really cool. Cool products are better, and cool businesses are best of all. If we're in a gold rush, try to make sure you're selling picks and shovels at least to your customers so that they go looking for you and you end up being a cool business no matter what happens with tech or the news around it. Now, looking at the clock on the wall, we are out of time for this week. I want to remind you that you can find the show notes for this episode, as well as an archive of all past episodes, by going to timpeter.com slash podcast. Again, that's timpeter.com slash podcast. Just look for episode 414. Don't forget that you can click on the subscribe link in any of the episodes that you find there to have Thinks Out Loud delivered to your favorite podcatcher every single week. You can also find Thinks Out Loud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Music, anywhere fine podcasts are found. I would also very much appreciate it if you could provide a positive rating or review for the show whenever you use one of those services. If you like what you hear on Things Out Loud, if you enjoy what we talk about, if you like being part of the community that we're building here, please give us a positive rating or review. Reviews help other listeners find the podcast. Reviews help other listeners understand what Things Out Loud is all about. They help to build our community, and they mean the world to me. So thank you so much for doing that. I very, very much appreciate it. You can also find Things Out Loud on LinkedIn by going to linkedin.com slash associates. You can find me on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it this week by using the Twitter handle at TCPeter. And of course, you can email me by sending an email to podcast at timpeter.com. Again, that's podcast at timpeter.com. Finally, and I know I say this every single week, I do truly want you to know how thrilled I am that you keep listening to what we do here. It means so much to me. You are the reason we do this show. You're the reason that Thinks Out Loud happens every single week. So please keep your messages coming on LinkedIn. Keep hitting me up on Twitter, sending things via email. I love getting a chance to talk with you, to hear what's going on in your world, and to learn how we can do a better job building on the types of content and community and information and insights that work for you and work for your business. So with all that said, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead, and I will look forward to speaking with you here on Things Out Loud next time. Until then, please be well, be safe, and as always, take care, everybody. 